right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeline or CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Steve Lowell, who is in Ottawa in Canada. How are you doing, Steve? I'm doing great, John. How are you? Yeah, and Steve has been speaking and performing live on stage since the age of six. That's over. Well, I won't even mention how many years ago. That is, but I appreciate that, John. Thank you. <laughs> and he's an award-winning global speaker. And for over 30 years, we've been training and mentoring executives, thought leaders, and professional speakers around the world to deliver high-impact keynote speeches and drive revenue from the platform and build wealth through speaking. So what we're going to talk about today uh, with Steve is so, Steve, say I'm a, I, you know, maybe I'm an executive or I'm a business owner, I'm somebody, and I want to expand maybe my my personal brand. Maybe I'm thinking of, you know, maybe I'm writing a book or whatever. And I think the next phase of my career should be to get into the speaking um, circuit. So a lot of people often tell me this and think that's that's kind of their plan, but don't really know where to start. So um, how do, what is your advice to people who are, first of all, contemplating doing it? And then how do you start? Sure. I, you know, I think one of the biggest things that we need to do if we choose to get into the speaking business, and the first thing is to identify what our purpose is. I mean, why are we even there? What is it that we want to share with this world? What is the change or the transformation that we want to make? What is the wisdom we want to impart? And so we need to know what our desired outcome is first. And, and without that, we're just kind of hitting in the dark and not really serving anybody. So that's number one. Choose what that purpose, what that desired outcome is. Then number two is decide what kind of speaker do you actually want to be? Do you want to be a motivational, inspirational speaker with powerful stories and, you know, to excite people and to motivate people? Do you want to be an educational speaker? Do you have knowledge, skills, wisdom that you want to transfer that to that audience so that they know something they didn't want to before? Or do you want to be, and this is the one I recommend that we all strive to be, do you want to be a transformational speaker? And what that means is, do you want to take Take all that wisdom and knowledge and experience and creativity that you have curated over your lifetime and use it to actually change lives, transform lives. And usually speakers can be all three of those if they plan the messaging properly. But the most powerful way to get into the speaking business and start building that personal brand is to do more than motivate, do more than inspire, do more than educate. I believe you actually need to transform. Mm. Yeah, I, I think those are excellent points, Steve. Yeah, because I, I, I think, you know, part of the, part of, I think, the feedback you often get when people go see speakers is they go, yeah, yeah, it was interesting. There was a couple of, of points in there. But to, but to your point, I think rarely do people come away feeling like, well, that was transformational. That was something that really changed my life. So in some ways, I feel it's like when people think they have a book in them like everybody thinks they have a speech in them too mm -hmm. and it's figuring i mean i guess as as you said it's really figuring out the purpose of it not just the safe doing it for the sake of doing it because we have plenty of those but find finding that purpose so when you work with people how do you help them kind of really drill down and find the purpose to make sure that they have something transformational to share so I use a, a process that I developed some years ago um, around which I, I based my book. It's called Deep Thought Strategy. And, and here's basically what this is, John. This is about uh, mining your wisdom and expertise, going deeper, deeper, deeper into your content, whatever it is, uh, deeper than you've ever gone before. And what we're looking for are those pieces that go beyond what I say common sense. I call it common sense into uncommon sense. And the purpose here is this. Here, here's the outcome we, we, we're trying to reach. When the audience hears you speak, the outcome you want or the response you want is this. You want them to go, huh, I've never thought of it like that before. That's the outcome we're after. And the reason we want that outcome, John, is because if we can change the way the audience thinks, if we can challenge their beliefs or rattle their paradigms or shake their perspective on something, that's where change and growth happens. And when we can do that as a speaker, what happens is that audience walks out the door being more than they were when they walked in the door. 
And that's the speaker that gets remembered. That's the speaker that gets asked back. That's the speaker that gets followed. So we need to do more than educate people. We need to get past their intellect and into their imagination and affect change. So when I work with people, that's what we strive for. It's not about, for me, it's not about getting on the stage and telling your story, although that is part of it, but it's not about Mm -hmm. that. It's not about getting on the stage and sharing all your great ideas, your six pillars to this and your four secrets to that and your strategies for this. That's part of it, but it's not about that. What it's about is using those stories and using all of that great IP that you may have developed and all those great ideas that you've curated over over the years and turning them into something that actually changes the audience's perspective. That's what we strive to do because I want the audience to leave that room and somehow changed, you know, mm-hmm. from when they came in. And education alone doesn't do that. And inspiration alone doesn't do that. It's when you change their beliefs. That's what does that. So that's kind of what we strive for. Yeah, that's a, a yeah, that's 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 fascinating. I love the idea about going um, really deep into and into the subjects and the IP and the experiences. Because again, like I, I said, like we some of us may have had experiences that we think are are quite interesting, but they might not actually translate into something. And the other thing I see often today is people think, okay, I just be a little bit provocative, you know, maybe I'll have a provocative title, maybe I'll swear, I don't know, whatever mm-hmm. it is. And that kind of stuff, that also, if it's provocative without substance, then it's just, there's no, there's not, no great, uh, no great shakes there either, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, I think everybody has a style. And I've always said that Mm -hmm. just because you're an offensive speaker, it doesn't make you a poor one. Um, Because Mm -hmm. there are a lot of amazing speakers out there that that are, you know, use foul language all the time. Uh, And and that doesn't make them bad speakers, because there's a market for that, just like there is for comedians and all Mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. It doesn't make them a bad speaker. But I think what sometimes happens, you know, and I agree with you, John, what sometimes happens is people adopt that persona because they think that that's what's going to make them popular. They think that that's mm-hmm. what's going to make them likable. So this is like comedians, you know, you go to see the stand up mm-hmm. comics and so many of them just use, you know, disgusting foul language. And it's not funny for 95 percent of the people, mm-hmm. but the 95 percent of the people for whom it's not funny, that's not their market. Their market yes. are the ones that find it funny. And so there's a market for all of those things, right? So what, what I try and do with, with, with a speaker is, you know, how do we find your authentic persona by first finding your authentic message? And that usually comes from that deep thought exploration into the content. And, and there's a couple of rules that I try and apply, not rules, but guidelines. You know, number one mm-hmm. is we try and find content that is unique. We try and take the content, even if it's not you know, brand new that no one's ever heard before, if we can Mm -hmm. position it so it sounds uniquely yours, that's very valuable. It needs to be something that comes from you. Um, It needs to be something that germinates from your creativity and wisdom experience and, and all of those things. And then the toughest one is I like to try and see if we can challenge a common belief. And so one of the ways we do that, and, and <laughs> the clients that speak mm-hmm. work with sometimes find this tough, John, is that I, I say, look, let's take everything you think you know, and let's try and disprove it. Let's, let's research it and try and disprove it. And, and the purpose isn't to disprove it. Yeah. The purpose is to go through the process. And what happens is we are able sometimes to challenge common beliefs. And when we do that for an audience and they go, I never thought of it that way before. It's really powerful. And when we get to that point, you'll find you don't need the gimmicks. You, you, you know, mm-hmm. you don't need to put on a facade. You don't need to show, you don't need theatrics or theater. You can still use those things. They're not wrong to use those things, but you don't rely on them. What you rely mm-hmm. on is that authentic message that comes from within you that nobody else has. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I guess that a lot of people, when you work with them, uh, before you work with them, think that when you become a speaker, like it's kind of like being an actor, isn't it? So you yeah. put on a persona when you get on stage. Whereas, as you said, it's more about almost the opposite, which actually is the opposite, which is the essence of acting is if it's if it's acting, then it's not acting, if you know what I mean. Yeah, it's not I've, real. I've heard that from and speakers it, too. Yeah. You're so right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I guess that that's the first one where you have to get people kind of transitioned over into okay, you know, you're going to be, we're going to find figure out how to be the best version of yourself, right, rather than a, a poor version of someone else. 
Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I want to talk about that for a second, too, because, um, you know, we hear a lot about uh, authenticity, right? Be authentic. Yeah, sure. Um, mm-hmm. And a lot of speaker coaches will say, you know, be authentic. Um, and I got to tell you that 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 only goes so far in this context. OK, uh, I remember one time um, about 15 years ago. Oh, less than that, maybe 10. I had a motorcycle accident. Nothing big, nothing major. But I fractured three ribs. Mm-hmm. The very next day I had to speak in front of a live audience. And if I was being authentic, I would have walked out there, there dragging myself and I would have said, look, the real, I don't want to be here today. I'm in pain. I feel awful. I haven't slept. I'm on drugs. The last thing I mm-hmm. want to do is be here. That would have been mm-hmm. my authentic expression, right? But of course we can't do that. So being authentic to me isn't always about you know, reflecting your authentic self in the moment. To me, mm-hmm. being professionally authentic is about professionally expressing your authentic passion for your craft, even if you don't feel like being there in the moment. It's just like, um, you know, same idea, you know, John, years ago, I played in a band, right? We were, we were playing bars mm-hmm. and all those things. And do you, you know how many times I, I was a guitar player and a singer in the band. And did you know how many times I played the song Brown Eyed Girl? I mean, uh. <laughs> I played that song more times than Van Morrison ever did, like thousands of times, right? And it's a great song. I love the song. But after the 18th time of the night, because it kept getting requested, I'm going, oh, my God. And if I was being authentic, this yeah. is how I would play it. I just strum and I go, oh, man, I don't want to do this song. Yeah. But I express my authentic passion for my craft, which means I do the song like it's the first time I've done it every single time, because that is the authentic self-expression of our craft. That's the professional authentic self-expression of our craft. And, and so I think that's really important. But you know what you said makes so much sense. You want to be the best version of you instead of a lousy version of somebody else. Mm-hmm. Sometimes being the best version of you means that you over, may have to overcome authentic feelings of fatigue fatigue, of anger, of whatever it is you're feeling that can be destructive in that moment and replace that with the professional self-expression of your uh, passion for your craft. And that's a different kind of authenticity that I think speakers need to learn. And, and, no, and be honest with you, John, most, most of us do. You know, professional speakers do that. Most professional speakers don't get up and reflect the fact that they feel like crap. <laughs> that day because they're hungover or, or whatever mm-hmm. it is. Yeah. Most of them get past that. Right. And so um, to me, that's where true authenticity, li- authenticity lies is the ability to be yourself when yourself is supporting the message and to get past yourself when yourself isn't supporting the message. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, Steve, that's, that's probably a great point for people who are thinking about going into speaking and going on, on the speaking circuit is, you won't always you won't always feel great. You won't always be on top of your game. You'll have circumstances. Your flight will be delayed. You'll get in at 2 a.m. in the morning and have to be on stage at 7 or whatever, or get in at 2 a.m. and have to then go and make sure your presentation is there. Whatever. All these things are, are going to, to happen to you. So I think that that message of you have to be prepared to be able to put your game face on, go on, give it your best shot, you know, you know, mm-hmm. normally it's probably an hour. So really, if you can't do that, then you should probably not get into this at all. <laughs> I, agree. <laughs> I agree. But it's a great point about that. The fact is that you're that it's not going to be you're not going to be 100 percent every time you go, but you got to give 100 percent. That, that well, 100 percent. That That's it. You know, and, <laughs> and I think, you know, when when we have more than just our stories and we have more than just you know our three secrets and five pillars and you know and four mm-hmm. strategies we have, we have more than that when we have a message that by itself changes the perspective of the audience that gives us a lot more confidence to be able to reach inside and pull that out because we get so much more passionate about something that we've created. We get so much more Mm -hmm. passionate about a message that we know is going to serve that audience more than our stories and our motivational messages. We get so passionate about it that it becomes easy to disregard all the, the, you know, the things that may be going on in our life that are distracting us or not serving us at that time and pull out our passion for that real message. And it, it just makes our lives so much easier, so much more productive, and between you and I, <laughs> a lot more profitable than just trying <laughs> yeah. to motivate somebody. 
Yeah, and I guess the other part, Steve, is like some people think, okay, I can do the I can do the speaking, so I'll just sit down and I'll I'll figure out and I'll write myself a, a good speech and I'll you know edit. Maybe I'll get somebody to look over and edit it. But um, and I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot different. It's sorry about that. It's a lot. It's a lot different from that. I mean, that's you could try it that way, but that's a long way around. So when you work with people, how do you help them actually start to really formulate the actual talk they're going to give? Right. I love this question because it challenges a common belief that I hear all the time. And that is, you know, Steve, I can just wing it. You know, I've been doing this so long. I can just wing it. And, and I'll tell you something. I've been all around this world. I've been doing this for, you know, for close to 40 years. Um, and there is nobody who can just wing it that I have ever seen. Maybe they're out there, but I've never met this person. And, and but here's the thing. The ones that look like they're winging it are not. And here's what they're doing. I always have said this, I, I teach speakers this, you need to go through your content until your content comes through you. And what that means is you need to know your stuff like your own name so that at any moment you can switch gears. Um, you can go to this module or tell that story or bring in this example or teach this concept, but it's not about winging it. It's about knowing your content so well that it requires almost no thought to deliver it. And so what I, when I'm working with speakers, this is what I try and get them to do. It's not about memorizing and reciting. Professional speakers, um, you know, do not do that. They might do it at first. They might write Mm -hmm. a speech and they might re memorize it and they might recite it, but they're not hitting the stage until that speech comes through them like their own name. And this is the difference between memorizing and reciting and internalizing mm -hmm. and sharing. So I try and get my clients, my client speakers to, to internalize and share. And if it happens to come out the exact same way every single time, that's okay. It's like going to listen to an Elton John concert, right? Elton John may sing the song Rocket Man. He hasn't mm -hmm. memorized it. He's not memorizing, you know, reciting a memorized song. He's singing something that is part of his soul and it comes out the same every single time. The difference is when you memorize and recite something is coming from your head. But when mm -hmm. you're part of your soul, when you've internalized it and now you're sharing it and now it's coming through you, it comes from inside here. It comes from inside. And, and when you can do that, the big thing that happens, John, is you get past the audience's intellect and into their imagination, and that's how you affect change. You can't get into an audience's imagination if you're speaking from your head. Mm. That's a really, that's a, a, a really, really excellent point. Um, and, and as you said, the ability to be able to flex a little, because I mean, that's the other truism is you're going to be in different audiences. You know, if, if, you're, if you're a speaker, you know, professional speaker in business, Cross industries, different markets. So you're going to have to be able to um, adapt things a little bit, and you're not going to be able to do that unless you're very comfortable with the underlying material. Exactly, and and this translates to sales. To bring it, uh, you know, more yeah. germane to the focus of of your your program here, um, you know. I, I sell from the stage for a living. That's what I do. I don't get speaker fees anymore. Uh, and the reason is because there's nobody out there that's going to pay me a speaker's fee that even comes close to what I can earn by making an offer in select places. Right. And so what I found is, you know, for so many years, John, I, I struggled to earn that living through speaking uh, other than speaking fees. Um, mm -hmm. But then once I learned these skills, and this is, you know, I'm going back 20, 25 years, 30 years. Once I learned these skills, when, I learned this. If I can make an audience question their beliefs, if I can rattle those paradigms and challenge those perspectives, then they, they come to me and they say, okay, now what do I do? And now mm -hmm. I, can, I can, you know, I've got products and programs and training and coaching and all that kind of stuff to sell. So they come to me looking for how I can help them rather than me looking for them to buy my stuff. Right. And so when I'm on the stage, I don't have to do the high pressure stuff. I don't have to do all of those tactics and techniques. I can do those and I have done those and I've made money with those, but I don't like doing those. And so what I find now is I don't have to do those anymore. And in the sales uh, situation, whether it's a speaking situation or not, I think there's a big parallel there because here's the thing. Here's what we want. We know this. You know that old adage that says, you know, people buy from people they know, like, and yeah. trust. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, just, I just think that is just woefully incomplete. Well, here's what I've learned. I've learned that our prospects 
uh, want three things. They want three things from us. And if we can give them these three things, then we rise to the top of the pack. Number one is they want to be understood. They want to be mm -hmm. able to feel, you know what? Uh, you get me. You get mm -hmm. me. Right. And so if I'm yeah. talking about my three pillars, five strategies, this secret, that's you get, I'm not telling them that I get them. I'm just saying, here's my stuff. Maybe it'll work for you. Buy my stuff. Yeah. Uh, they need to know that I get them. Number two mm -hmm. is they need to feel safe. They need to figure, you know what? I got their back. So then if they watch me speak and, and, and you know, all the ones that make the, the, the best sales speaking or even in just a, you know, a, a non-speaking sales environment, if the mm -hmm. prospect thinks, you know what? You get me and I feel safe. You got my back, right? Yeah. And then the third thing they want is I think you can actually help me. Those are the things I think that are the pillars of triggering a real sales conversation. So, and without any of those, I mean, if you yep. miss one, if you miss one of them, it doesn't matter if they know you like you or trust or they're not buying from you because you don't get them. You don't understand them. You don't have their back and they don't feel safe. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, and I think, um, Steve, in, in fairness, I think these are even more important than ever because people have been through such strange experiences over the last few years that uh yeah if they if they don't feel like you understand them or they don't feel safe or, or they don't think you can help you you're correct uh, it's going to be a hard struggle and that's why i think a lot of sales people are struggling today with no decisions because in times of uncertainty it's much easier to make no decision than it is to actually pull the trigger unless the person who's selling you has made you feel understood safe and can help you yeah. And, and this is the power of being a good speaker in the sales environment, because it positions you, John, where your prospects come to you. And, and the question isn't how much do you charge? The question is, when can we get started? And they come mm -hmm. looking for you and you don't any longer have to justify. You don't have to compete. You don't have to compare. You don't have to close. You don't have to do those things nearly as much because they watch you on a boardroom or a platform or on a, a virtual platform. And because you've done these things that we've been talking about, they kind of go, you know, I, I want to talk to that one. I want mm -hmm. that one. I'll yeah. tell you, it's a much easier sale when that happens. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, 100%, absolutely. Well, listen, Steve, this is fantastic. All of Steve's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Sure. So um, my name is Steve Lowell from Ottawa, Canada. For the last 35 years, I've been training professional speakers um, and entrepreneurs, coaches, thought leaders, uh, you know, nonfiction authors all over the world uh, to monetize their message from the platform in a way that doesn't provide that icky feeling like you feel like you need a shower after, <laughs> you, you know. Um, and uh, I, I, for the last year, I have served as the president of the Global Speakers Federation, representing 17 professional speakers associations around the world. Right. Um, my, uh, my tenure is done now. I've handed over the keys to the next one. But in that capacity, uh, I've been able to travel the world, um, you know, virtually over the last year. But prior to that, um, you know, my wife and I traveled the world and met mm -hmm. and worked with some of the top salespeople on the planet and some of the top speakers in the planet. Uh, and and I've learned these things. I've learned that if 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 you can do the things we're talking about today, those are the things that that really make a difference. And so I do coaching. I do mentorship. It's all on my website. I've got some e-learning programs there. Uh, and if you want to take another look and, you know, dip your toe and dive a little bit deeper, it's all there. Yeah, no, they're fantastic. And I would uh, encourage you to check it out because, uh, you know, having done plenty of speaking myself, it's fantastic. Um, but it's better if you know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's way better if you know what you're doing, John. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Listen, thanks, Steve. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll talk to you all again soon. Bye bye.